Hello, everyone. Hey. <laughs> now, my apologies, we had some technical difficulties over here at RMIT Online, but we are about to kick off. My name is Oscar Sandos. I'm part of the industry partnerships team at RMIT Online, and we are just about to kick off this awesome on the couch session. Um, before we do, um, allow me to introduce some of our guests for today. I'm going to pass over first to Josh for Concentrics. Josh, Please give the, the with introduce yourself and give a little brief explanation of who you are and why you're joining today. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Josh Tunsing. So I'm one of the engineering leaders at Concentrics Catalyst. So we're a customer experience services company, and I predominantly work with large clients and uh, government entities in regards to the way that they're adopting new and innovative technologies. So understandably, at the moment something that's very important to companies in this space is generative AI or AI in particular, and I'm supporting them in the way that they're adopting and innovating their products to utilize these new capabilities. Thanks, Josh. Danny, from REA, do you mind giving a little brief intro as well? Yeah. Hey, uh, my name's Danny Garcia. Um, I work as an AI product manager um, in our consumer team at REA. So the consumer team is mostly like the front end teams with the web and app. So uh, realestate.com, uh, the red brand. Um, yeah, uh, currently we are one of the first centralized AI teams at REA. Uh, we've gone through quite a big transformation journey as well. So I can't wait to share some kind of insights and learnings and hopefully, uh, yeah, uh, you think it's interesting. Thanks, Danny. Um, over to Samantha. Hi, I'm Sam. I am a product manager on the Slack team. And I actually don't have like a core, like I'm not a part of our core AE team, but I'm a product manager that works at the intersect of Slack and Salesforce. And we also inter look at, are looking at integrating in, in AI into some of the features that we're building in the future. So that's my viewpoint for today. Sam, thank you so much. Um, I think what I'd love to do is jump in to some of the questions um, that we've got prepared today. Um, and, and starting off, something for all of you. AI has been a hot topic and making waves for quite some time now. A recent IBM survey reported that the product managers rank among the top 10 user groups leveraging AI in organizations. How do you think AI has impacted the industry so far? Who wants to take that first? Uh, I, I suppose I can chime in with uh, to say that I think the industry doesn't really know how to react at the moment. I think that the new technology is largely unparalleled in almost all of history in regards to its capability to impact every industry on the planet. And um, from my experience, that most people are simply trying to understand what it even does, let alone trying to use it at scale. It, it's a very intimidating uh, opportunity where there, there's amazing opportunity in there, but finding how to apply it is quite difficult at the moment. I think to expand on that, I think everyone's like really excited about the ability to bring automation and efficiency into some like big decisions. And they see that and they just like get very excited by it. But then it's all about like, well, how do we implement it and how do we go down that path? And this just because there's just so many problems that it can potentially solve, it just generates that much buzz and excitement. And it's why it's gotten the amount of like press coverage that it's gotten to date. Um, but yeah, I, I'd be keen to hear your thoughts as well, Danny. Yeah. So to add on that, like I think it's not just all the, the wonderful problems it can solve, it's also the considerations and the problems it can also create. Um, and I think that's really reshaping how like people's mindsets, particularly product managers when they go into software development, because I think we're moving away from building in this linear path with quite a lot of certainty, say in software development, you know your errors, you know your bugs, you kind of like you do a lot of testing in use cases. Um, and we're being asked to be really comfortable with the uncertainness of AI with model development. Um, so you're basically building and knowing that you're going to build a product and create a product with unlimited edge cases. Uh, and you need to make that really transparent somehow with users as well. So there's two like great challenges as well, I think, in the industry, um, particularly that we've been facing um, over the year with AI. 
Yeah, fascinating. And I, I think we we can all agree that a lot of the challenges we don't even know yet what I, what is coming down the road. Um, and I think there's a, an element of excitement and also nervousness that sits around that particular that particular topic. Thank you for all sharing. Um, Kevin, I can see that you've joined the call. I've just been keeping the seat warm <laughs> as the narrator um, for this moment. And I'll hand over to you now um, to continue and pick up the conversation with the group. Fantastic. Thank you, Oscar. And um, yeah, just a few technical issues getting in, but lovely to meet uh, everybody here on the panel. Um, one thing I can say, Josh, Sam and Danny, when I was just looking through your LinkedIn profiles, I pulled out a few themes and uh, about the role of um, product management and what you do. And some of those were things like visionary leadership, collaboration, connecting, safe spaces to innovate and work together, inclusive, human-centred and ethics and justice. And I think, like Danny, your last point um, raised there, I think is really quite interesting around um you know, this is, a, this is a different world that we're going into. There's clearly a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of investment um, taking place, but it is an uncertain roadmap ahead. So I think as we um, continue on in, in the exploration of your experience and your insights, this one is to Josh. Um, research conducted by Deloitte highlights just 5% of Australian businesses are fully prepared to deploy and leverage AI. How do you get stakeholder buy-in for AI initiatives in product management? Yeah, well, I, I would say that getting stakeholder buy-in for AI initiatives is not actually overly difficult. Most businesses are, are quite keen to, to explore the possibilities they can offer. Uh, I think the key word in the statement is that only 5% are prepared to deploy a, a solution. Uh, the complexity involved in generating AI at any level at the moment or integrating it is actually quite low all, all our favorite tools like open ai and meta and google and anthropic they've all put quite a low bar on the way that you need to adopt their tooling um, the challenge is progressing it from a proof of concept to uh something production ready it's orders of magnitude more difficult far greater than anything that I've ever witnessed. And I think a lot of companies struggle with that transition. It's interesting you say that because we we know that uh, with Armour's Curve, for example, you get new technologies that emerge, there's a big buzz, and then there's a lot of excitement and, and intent, but the delivery or I guess the proof of concept takes some time. But what you point out is that the bar, the barrier to entry is very low because the tools are, are, are offered free. You know, in terms of uh, in terms of their basic uh, um, iterations, and so you get people able to experiment, and so many people able to, I guess, envis envisage the possibilities. So, how do you think that that might impact this this movement towards deployment in terms of the the gap between the investment and the excitement of opportunity, and then the realization, and then the the willingness to go down that deployment road? Uh, I think that uh, most people actually get quite a shock when when they start an understanding the complexity involved in, in doing that transition. It is not just plugging in a traditional technology. There's a, there's a number of ethical concerns and technical concerns and financial concerns that you need to deal with that are largely unprecedented. No technology has ever impacted industry like this where it's largely an unknown um the, the the way that i like to equate it for, for a lot of the clients is to say that like if i brought in the world's smartest person and brought them into your office and said they could be part of your team and took them around and showed them to all the people and had everyone ask them questions and that person would respond with perfect answers every time but then i said okay i want to give this person access to all your financials the answer would be no. If I said, I want to make this person the mouthpiece for your company and all your customers liaise with this person, the answer would be no. But that's what generative AI realistically is when you break it down to a very sort of abstract concept. And you would want to put that person, that very smart person, even though they're very capable through a number of processes before you would even remotely entertain the thought of, of giving them that level of responsibility. And that's what 
generative AI is doing. It's the equivalent of bringing this person in and showing them to everyone. And everyone says, this is great. We should bring them into the company. And then you suddenly are aware of actually it's not that easy. Interesting. And that's probably where that that bigger vision of possibilities versus the smaller components of how we step along the journey becomes important. Interesting. Thank you, um, Josh. And Danny, um, RIA Group has made headlines uh, last year about investing in AI and machine learning. Um, So over the last few years, um, across a number of different teams, how are you and your product team leveraging AI? Yeah, so... um... We've actually gone through quite a, a huge transformation journey in, in my team that I lead. Uh, so we started as a data science team, a very small and nimble data science team uh, full of uh, yet yeah, more statisticians. Uh, and now we've grown and put that investment into our team and we are growing into a fully f- fledged product AI team that is more centralised to uh, the company. However, we're decentralized in our approach in that we enable and we partner with heaps of experienced squads and teams around REA um, to help them leverage our AI products that we build and uh, really kind of ideate ideate with them about new customer opportunities and experiences. And we're kind of leading the way in AI literacy as well. So really helping upskill the company and writing the guiding principles around it and and just really getting people on board onto the journey of AI as well. Uh, We've hired, you know, ML engineers as well, not just data scientists. So we're really like making a very uh, cross-skilled and collaborative uh, team as well. Uh, So that's kind of the approach we've we've taken um, and we're going to be releasing some pretty amazing uh, AI features in the coming year as well with those experience squads, which is really exciting. Um, and just in technology wise, we've been exploring Gen AI, um, of course. So VLNs and large language models to detect uh, new property features and reimagining renovations and homes. You can actually see this product in the app as well. It's really, really um, interesting and interactive, and it's definitely ticks the box of a creative use case that's really, really beneficial for the end user. Um, but we're also still ensuring that we're leveraging traditional AI products like recommendations. Um, and that's because that product is still one of the most valuable AI products in the market. Um, it's, you know, proven success through many different companies as well. Um, and yeah, that's the kind of areas that we've really been leveraging AI right now. Uh, we've also been exploring on how we can like develop feedback loops with uh, consumers as well. Uh, this has now become like quite a non-negotiable product requirement. So it's really asking users to let us know if the model is getting it right or wrong. Um, And that's great for not just the model development, but also really good in trying to get customers comfortable with AI, uh, building that kind of trust that, hey, we we don't actually know if this model will get it right all the time, but you need to trust us that we're still trying to do right by you. Um, And we're kind of putting the power back to the customer and controlling that as well. So, yeah. That sounds like a really smart way to go. And it's it's certainly enabled by digital digital products that you can get that feedback loop. And um, and I think, uh, as mentioned, um, you know, some of those ethical concerns and what have you in the trust building can be done by taking them on the journey, almost yeah. like as a co-creation piece. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think um, quite a lot of other companies are exploring that as well. You, you'll you'll see it more, I think, in the coming year where the, these feedback loops become more embedded in that kind of experience. And it's really to build that trust and education for people as well. I think it's really important. Fantastic. And I believe, uh, Oscar, we've got a, an audience poll, which is really then checking out uh, from those people in the audience how they're currently leveraging AI at work. And um, and then, you know, if they've got the A to D responses, then, um, then they can um, choose that or uh, whether they are not yet embracing it. So it'll be interesting to see how... Um, how that plays out. While that poll is um, is taking place, Sam, I'll move over to you. And uh, Slack has been in the news quite a bit with the um, recent launch of Slack AI, a set of generative AI tools built for teams to be the, um, at their most productive. How did you take the rising trend of large language models 
we know as LLMs, and turn into a new product feature? And more generally, how can product managers analyze market trends when there are so many? And how do you know that it's not just a fad? So many questions. I'm going to open with, I am not the product manager on the Slack AI product, but I would love to talk about it. Um, and I'm just a huge firm believer that bringing in AI into a product is only suitable when it's the right solution. It's not just because you can call it AI and put magic stars around it. Um, and that's what we try to do with Slack AI, obviously. Um, and it's really important to understand what the customer needs are with clear use cases to support why using an LMM can add value to the end user. Um, in the case of Slack AI, there are a number of examples where we took a customer problem and used AI to solve it. Um, Slack is just filled with a lot of unstructured data. So what Slack AI does um, is it makes the overall Slack experience a lot more pleasant for those that are including in a lot of discussions um, that need to be brought up quickly to speed on a project um, with our summarization feature. Our recap feature allows users that are within a lot of channels that, that typically generate a lot of noise um, to essentially just get a daily like recap of what's happened across all of those conversations so that you have the ability to just like see where you need to go, where you need to be at the same time. I think that's how it saves me hours a day. Um, and then that's also paired with the fact that we provide receipts. So whenever we generate that AI generated content, we try to provide a receipt as to what's generated that. And what that does is it allows us or allows the end user to sense check the hallucinations to make sure that the data that's being displayed to them is correct, which I think is like very important when it comes to summarization data. Um, but to go back to one of the last question was like, how do we evaluate if these aren't fads? And I think the the long-term strategy there is to ensure that you're evaluating the longevity of the feature that you're building. So assess whether the trend um, addresses like the fundamental need and that we're solving for substantial improvements in efficiency, I think is the most important thing. Um, it's, and again, not just because we're sprinkling AI branding on everything. I think that's the most important thing. Just on that, um, Sam, um, how, do, how important do you think Look, I, I get the sense everyone's embracing it and you can see where there are quick wins. How important is it with this investment, this early investment, which may be able to achieve some small tangible things? Um, is, is it important not to necessarily uh, measure too big because we don't quite know where we're going to land, but rather maybe measure some things, as you point out, things like maybe um, you've got, data that's that's a little bit chaotic and you're able to streamline the experience and those types of things? I'd argue that you could measure the little things, but I think they have big impact. Um, the, the recap feature is a really good one that I use um, on a daily. Um, at, the end of, at the end of the feature, it just summarizes, hey, in the past, this would have taken you three hours to do. You've done it in 10 seconds. Okay. Um, and that is like a very small thing to measure. But yeah. I think that's really important, especially to illustrate to the end user as well. Can they they can see the benefit that they're getting out of using AI, which they may not have like thought about until like the end of the experience. But yeah, I think it's it's worth measuring the small things. And I do wonder too, because we know that well, maybe digital organizations have more of an agile digital mindset in terms of the possibilities, but um sometimes um you know, the measurement of things that are deemed efficiencies, like the example that you you mentioned versus AI and its potential to create new opportunities, which we don't even know that we'll be creating and measuring in future. Where do you see the balance between that playing out and getting buy-in from, from leadership? I think it's about trying to understand the, the question but for me I what we try to do on my team is identify where the biggest pain points and essentially time sinks are in someone's day-to-day -day and say this is we we have identified this as a problem we suspect using AI will give us the ability to improve on this let's investigate this further we suspect it will go in this direction using x y and z and then just use data to to back that up as you develop a feature and uh, as product managers you you're never sort of operating in a vacuum. You won't start data at the side of a project and check it at the end. You'll always be sense checking your data as your project evolves to make sure that you're going in the right path that you anticipated. So it becomes iterative. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. And Josh, as um, group manager at uh, Concentric Catalyst, 
Uh, you regularly work with a number of different clients. What kind of responses have you been seeing from clients when introducing new technology like AI? Yeah, so the the short answer I'd say is that they're all overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's a lot to absorb. Um, the the longer answer that I'd say is that it's an interesting environment at the moment. Like uh, we've discussed, as we've discussed, there's a significant amount of interest in adopting AI into their products or in, into their business. Um, and I'd say that every client that we're working with is investigating possibilities in some way. Uh, everyone we speak to is keen to understand how it can be folded into their business. Um, but that in itself, I probably would say, is the challenge is that its possibilities are nearly endless like they're infinite every business unit can benefit from its utilization um, in in some way and in many ways the overlap in regards to how the users would interact with it uh nearly zero like for, for, for a lot of tools like engineers could use it for code assistance mm -hmm. where customer su support could use it for a chatbot and then the design team could use it for generating imagery and they could all be powered by chat gpt but the implementations and the integrations are, are wildly different. So not, not since the internet was created with something where it has the possibility to create and disrupt every business unit, every user, including customers, employees, like everyone will be impacted by any integrations that you could do. So there's a the common response, I would say, is that, uh, that this is far more involved than almost any other decision they've had to make. And, and just, just on that, um, you said that there's a little bit overwhelmed and what have you. Uh, are you then telling a story that has a horizon of the short-term cycle of 12 months? We invest whatever, what do we get? Or are they looking two years or five years ahead in terms of how you're trying to impact the mindset? Uh, I, I would say that even if they're looking 12 months out, they're thinking far too broad. And in, in a, a number of engagements that I've done with clients recently, I said that if you went back 12 months and you wrote down like all the cutting edge AI technology and you said, we're going to build a tool with this and we're going to ship it in 12 months, I could tell you today that if you deployed it today, it would be a terrible solution. Everything would be out of date to the point where you wouldn't even envision putting it out into the, the industry. So with the generative AI platform, it, it is forcing companies to be far more agile in the way that they adopt their products and all the impacts that it can have in regards to what it's actually going to be changing inside their products. Interesting. And, and wherever you've got that level of dynamism, the dynamic sort of framework, it's actually a great place to be working in as somebody who's got skills, capability and leadership because there's not many people that would understand it so well to be able to drive that level of agility and, and innovation. So it seems to come at a premium as well. So a good area to be in. Absolutely. And as you mentioned, like only 5% of businesses are ready to deploy generative AI and being part of that 5% is very hard. So mm -hmm. having the capability to allow people to do that is uh, very in demand at the moment. Fantastic. And here's a question for each of you to consider. Um, how do product managers navigate increasingly uh, complex ethical considerations related to issues like data privacy and AI bias? And I notice in the chat, one or two questions coming up around things like choice and what have you. So um, um, do you want to kick that off, Josh? Um, I, I, I can talk more at a technical standpoint in regards to the tech, the privacy and, and the AI bias, as in integrating a lot of these uh, tools into your platform and not just simply wiring it in and plugging it in because you've got concerns in regards to people putting incorrect data into the requests or secure information into the request. We've seen that issue pop up in the past with companies like Samsung, where the developers were putting in proprietary code into ChatGPT and it was being spit, spat out at the other end by uh, companies that weren't Samsung. Or you can be dealing with uh, outputs coming through which are problematic or potentially illegal. So if you've got a company that is providing a chatbot and that chatbot is unintentionally providing financial advice, that could get you in a lot of hot water. Mm -hmm. So having that technical layer 
before and after the user or before and after the generative AI tool to make sure that the quality going in and the quality coming out is, it's quite difficult, but it's pivotal to, to implement this sort of tool. Indeed. I know, Danny, this is um, really a hallmark of uh, your focus. Uh, yeah, it is. Um, I would say in terms of what a product manager can practically do right now, um, read the regulations, like read what's the policies happening in the market as much as you can. And there's many different ethic policies, um, you know, GDPR and what's happening in America and many different like uh, proprietary limited companies like Google and, and Apple, they all have their different kind of privacy and ethics um, guidelines, but read as much as you can and really understand what the kind of thread and of commonality is, which is transparency and its accountability and its responsibility, right? And as a product manager, you can be a real champion in understanding that and learning that and taking that into your development. So when you go to leverage AI products, when you go to ideate, you can really have these questions right at the beginning of ideation. And the question isn't, could we be doing this? Because yes, you could do lots of things with AI. It's, should we be doing this? What is the actual benefit for the end user? Is this actually benefiting the end user? Are we using like data that we just shouldn't be using and touching like people's email addresses and things like that? Do we, do we need that data? So I think as a product manager, practically what you can do is keep being curious and asking those questions in every stage of the development life cycle until the release and even after the release when you're monitoring the model and you're making sure that it isn't unconsciously biased like um you know data drifting or you know it's uh, excluding a, a user from a particular use case that's something that i think very practically the a product manager can do um but yeah just be a champion as well like go into your companies or you know um join meetup groups as well there's heaps of like ethic comedic meetup groups up there and really get involved because it's actually a really interesting, um, I think it's really fascinating. Um, and I think it, it's really interesting to join those communities and kind of being a bit of a voice and, you know, putting the customer at the heart of the why is, is always the, the main principle for product management. So it sounds like there's a there's an issue around governance, but even learning what needs governance, what that framework encompasses, um, or or perhaps even let's not overcomplicate it. We're just talking about a new technology and we already have governance frameworks over existing technologies, but let's make sure that they're applied. And, yeah. and Sam, what about yourself? I think to sort of do the opposite end. So rather than legal or compliance and governments, I'd love to talk about like the end user and like the end customer, which is like usually enterprise, mm -hmm. um, especially on in Slack and Salesforce, for example. Um, in Slack, not everyone has access to every single channel. And it's important that when you're using the AI tools within it, that you're only exposed to the data that you should have access to. And ensuring that those permissions are mapped correctly with all of the data that comes to you as well is incredibly important. And then when you start talking about data that lives in other environments like Salesforce, where you have customer data that has the next level when it comes to like policy enforcement, it's just really important that as a product manager, you're thinking about that to ensure that you're not just creating a really wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, AI experience, you're actually creating something that's also really relevant to enterprise customers and the enterprise needs of those, those users. Fantastic. Um, and Danny, can you give us an example of brands that you think are leveraging AI really well, specifically in product management? Yeah, sure. So I think um, there's a couple ones that come to mind. So there's Canva. Uh, open AI, of course, uh, you know, what they've done with um, generative AI and also how they're changing the product management industry in, in terms of the tools that we can use are really wonderful. And there are some great talks out there that I would recommend and encourage everyone to have a, a bit of a listen to with open AI, um, heads of products. Uh, but there is also another brand that I found really interesting that was Shopify. Uh, so Shopify have been exploring Gen AI in their like content description um, for their products, as well as recommendations and personalization. Um, and they're really also leading the way in the AI product management development. Uh, so they have this kind of product review process code, it's called Get Shit Done, sorry for my language, but that's what it's called. 
Um, and it's this really lean canvas style to quickly experiment and test their prototypes. And they have a number of different AI prototypes to quickly get out in the market. And instead of doing heaps of meetings and like really long ideation sessions, they're able to quickly demo those showcases to a, a range of different stakeholders to get it to market. And that experimentation phase is a really, really fascinating thing now about product management development for AI. Um, something that is probably not as apparent in, in traditional software development. So they're really leading, leading the charge on how to like make those processes for product management. Obviously, creating feedback loops was one of their number one things as well. Um, you know, they quickly collaborate with their customers um, and their merchants, which they take to market and, and see how, how valuable that product is for them. So it's really, they're really drawing on being like lean, experimental and developing with the end user in mind. So yeah, that was probably the best example that I, I could think of, yeah. Fantastic. Good to get an array of examples. Now, cognizant of time, what I'm going to do is throw to some questions that have come through the chat and any one of you can choose to answer any one question. We might just have one of you post some of these questions and see if we can get a few um, questions addressed from the um the attendees. So what are the uh, industry requirements to be classified as an AI product manager? You'd like to have a go at that. Is there some requirement or some education or what have you to be um, uh, an AI product manager? Kevin, I have a BA in photography, so I'm probably the wrong one to admit that I'm going to be answering this question. I do not think you need to have like an actual certification to to be in that in in that industry, I do think they would be helpful. So, for example, I'm currently doing the RMIT online risk and governance course um, at the moment, and that is like incredibly helpful um, in dealing with some of these conversations. But I definitely don't think it's a hard requirement. That being said, I don't think product management in general has a very like concrete career path. Photographer, for example, is a really good one. Um, but I know Danny has a very different background to me, and I think her background is very much well suited to more of an AI um, discovery path. So maybe you could jump into yours, your background a bit more. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's funny you say that because uh, my background was a, I was a dancer before I even got into tech. So like we all come from very crazy backgrounds to get to where we are. Um, but yeah, there are heaps of short courses, I think, in terms of product management and like trying to um, educate yourself, like there's like six month courses you can do just to get the foundations of that. Um, and with AI, there's also many different courses out there. I would say try to find something that is reputable and has like quite a lot of quality, get the foundations of it. Personally, I did a master's in data science, as it was called back then, in strategy and leadership at RMIT. Um, which I found amazing. It was the perfect blend of tech and also business. Um, and that helped me immensely in my career. However, I would say I'm like, I'm right in the thick of the AI technology. And that was for me to really learn about AI technology. Um, I think as a product manager, you, you might not want to go that deep, but yeah, there's definitely lots and lots of options out there. Fantastic. And, and and I'm program manager of the graduate certificate in product management here at RMIT online. So there, there is that type of option for somebody who wants, again, the foundations of being able to apply that to their, their industry. Josh, maybe this one for you. What's the difference between AI-led product development versus AI-assisted product development? Uh, this is quite a... Um... Uh, front of mind topic for me because I, I've been working with a lot of clients in regards to this where I, I have been looking at the complexities involved in having AI solving problems for you. So typically I would refer to it as an agent where it'll go away and complete a complex process. And at the moment, that is a very difficult uh, thing to land. But then uh, the other thing that I would say is that assistance for me is where AI will really be able to shine because almost everyone wants to keep one hand on the wheel. I, even in regards to customer service, I, we, we look at customer service and we talk to chatbots, but a lot of the time people still want to have that human interaction, that speaking to a person. So it may not be replacing people with chatbots, but making the people that are supporting the customers far more effective and far more efficient at supporting the amount of 
volume of people that you, you, you're you trying to support, make them more effective at that role. So I think that they're going to be essentially two different industries at the end of the day that will spin out of this generative AI sort of change that's coming through the industry. And uh, people will have very strong opinions on which path that they should take in regards to the solutions that they'll offer. Most interesting. So quite a pertinent question there. And thank you for addressing that. What about, um, here's a question, how do you see AI imp impacting UX, UI capabilities in future? Who'd like to tackle that one? I can quickly, briefly answer. It already is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like Figma design, um, Canva, you know, um, UX and UI tools certainly are now embedding um, AI all throughout it. However, I would say also that the UX designers that I work with and the product designers that I work with, they are now all rapidly upskilling to understand Gen AI more and to build frameworks within their design patterns and uh, like principles as well, like design principles with AI. So it's a really emerging trend and emerging field. Um, and you'll find that it's going to quick, quickly get uplifted, I think, in that industry for UX and UI for sure. Yeah. Fantastic. And we've probably got time for just one more question. Um, what do you see as... Um... What are the new skills and competencies that will be critical for product management teams in the uh, AI area? So when, when people are looking and sort of saying, I want to get involved in product management, maybe joining a, a team in an organization, what do you see as the key skills and competencies that, that um, and maybe each of you could just sort of throw in a couple of ideas here? The thing that I'd probably say, and, and Danny would probably concur with this, is that uh, data, I think knowing how to uh, retrieve and uh, collect data for the right type of generative AI processes that you're going to be providing to your customers is going to be critical. Uh, generative AI is incredibly capable, but then it, it is also incredibly diverse in regards to what it's actually responsible for in regards to providing outputs. And you want to try and constrain that as much as possible because otherwise you're going to be dealing with a lot of problems in regards to it hallucinating or just putting out bad responses and limiting that by knowing what data you can feed it and the structures that you can give it to make it as effective as possible and the processes that you're getting it to achieve will be pivotal for its success. For me, when I'm whenever I'm talking to customers, I say generative AI is probably only 10% of this generative AI like integration, it's actually everything to support the generative AI that's going to be the real challenge. And, and knowing that, I think, is going to be critical for a successful product manager. Fantastic. Sam, in 30 seconds? Um, on the complete flip side, I think having a really good understanding of the legal, legal implications of AI and understanding what the frameworks are and um, what the regulations are just and how to hold yourself in a, in a conversation when you're talking about that is really important. There are a number of electives uh, with the RMIT online that help you understand that a little bit more. Um, I've got them in my to-do list. Um, but yeah, I think that's really important, especially when you're talking on that topic. Fantastic. And Danny, in 30 seconds? Viability. I think business skills, like really understanding the viability of the product. Um, so learn about cost and cost benefit, especially with AI, because people still don't really understand what the cost benefit is. Um, it will be up to you to really demonstrably like prove that to the business and really get the best business case that you can. So upskill in things like financial management and yeah, analytics for sure. But those core competency like business skills are, are really going to get you through, especially with um, proving the viability of an AI product. Fantastic. So it still fits very much within that general framework of the business in terms of desirability, feasibility and viability. Yeah, fantastic. Look, I'd, I really want to thank um, everyone for attending this webinar today. I think this is a really exciting topic. Clearly, we've been very fortunate to have um, three key panellists in um, Josh and Sam and and Danny with diverse but also um, integrated um, experiences, capabilities and shared knowledge. So a big thank you to all of them. A big thank you to Oscar Santos and Snito 
Kanemuth and their team for organising this event on behalf of RMIT Online. Please note this session was recorded, so please look out for it in your emails for a copy. We host events like this uh, almost every month, so if you're keen to attend uh, more, please keep an eye out uh, on your social channels for what's upcoming. And lastly, if you're interested in upskilling in product management, please check out RMIT online courses. Um, link to our re related courses will be shared in the chat, which I can see it now has been by Sneeta. So th thank you very much, everyone, for devoting your time to this webinar today, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.